Into the Dollhouse I was nine years old when I first learned the value in hunting for a bargain. My mom was a single parent with four young girls to care for and, to put it mildly, money was tight. At first, I resented being drugged out of bed every Saturday morning at the crack of dawn to troll through the town's yard sales. Of course, like most children, I was oblivious to all of the effort and hard work it took from my mother just to be able to keep a roof over our heads and food on the table. I just hated that nearly all of my clothing and toys were secondhand throwaways. And then came that Saturday morning when, at yet another yard sale, I found a treasure hidden among pieces of worn furniture and television sets that were probably older than my mom was. And back then, I thought she was ancient. It was the bike. My bike. The same one that I would stare at every day walking home from school. It was always centered in the front display window of the local toy store, and it was beautiful. It was painted pink and green with iridescent streamers and a metal basket, and I wanted it more than anything I'd ever wanted in my entire nine years of life. Every day, I would press my hands and face up against the glass and imagine myself riding it through the neighborhood. Feeling the wind in my hair and basically being the envy of all of my friends. It was too expensive, my mom would always tell me when I asked for it at every birthday. Every Christmas. I even tried Earth Day for two years straight. And yet, here it was. A bit worse for wear, of course. The paint was a bit scuffed and a few of the streamers had frayed off, but I didn't care. In my mind, it was still the same bicycle and it was only $10. My mother even talked the woman running the sale down to five dollars, like a boss. And then it was all mine. I cleaned it up, I replaced the streamers and tires, and it was still beautiful to me. Maybe even more so. From that day on, I learned to enjoy the hunt, searching for those diamonds in the rough. I grew up learning to be frugal and save money wherever I could. As an adult, I still attended a few yard sales, although I spent most of my time treasure hunting at flea markets and estate sales, as the quality of the items were substantially higher. It was at one such estate sale that I found a beautiful old Victorian-style dollhouse. Like my bike, it was also a bit scuffed. Some of the pieces of movable furniture were broken, and there was some weird black paint on one of the walls above a faux fireplace but it came with six tiny dolls. A finely dressed mother and daughter as well as four servants that included a maid, a cook, a gardener, and what appeared to be a young stable boy. Their clothing was stained and worn and a few of their limbs hung loose and the gardener's face appeared to have been badly burned at some point, but the entire set had obviously been handmade with real wood, cloth and paint, not cheap plastic or silicone. And the detail was immaculate. The house itself had three floors which contained six bedrooms, a kitchen, dining room, bathroom, living room, and directly above all of those was an attic. The attic was huge, and it came complete with antique chests that opened and closed, a tiny bed and a full-size mirror with gilded edges. The craftsmanship was incredible. It would have taken someone years of their life to make such a creation. Even the fireplace in the living room had been painted in such a way as to give the illusion that there was a fire actually burning there. I knew I would purchase it the moment I saw it. It was the perfect gift for my young niece, Aria. She was about to turn nine herself, and she'd just been diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder that required her to spend most days in bed undergoing various medical treatments. I knew she was feeling lonely and discouraged. My plan was to take it home, give the entire home and family of dolls an extensive makeover. I was able to purchase the whole set for a measly $50 from the young woman in charge of the sale. She seemed only too happy to see it go, and the price alone should have been a red flag for me, even in its damaged state. 
The antique house was easily worth five times the amount she asked, but I just assumed she was just too ignorant to know the real value of the item. After finding little else of interest that day, I returned home with my prize. I wanted to start working on it immediately as Arya's birthday was only two weeks away. The moment I brought it into the house, my black cat, Onyx, began hissing and he ran to hide under my bed. For hours he stayed there, all the while emitting non-stop growls and strange croaking noises that I'd never heard him make before. It was odd as he was always a friendly laid-back animal, but I ignored yet another warning sign, and I shrugged it off with the thought that perhaps the dollhouse just had a strange smell. I spent a few hours that day on YouTube learning the best ways to restore the house and their figures to their former glory. The first thing I researched was how to get that strange black paint off the wall of the house without causing any damage. Several videos suggested simply using rubbing alcohol and a washcloth to dissolve the paint. So I tried it. It worked beautifully, as the paint came right off. Once it was removed, I was thrilled to see that there was some ornate design underneath. I couldn't quite make it out, and had to return with a magnifying glass to get a better look. It too was faded, but it seemed to be a painting of a snake with a black head and a white tail. The head appeared to be eating its own tail, and inside the circle of its body was a glowing depiction of the all-seeing eye. I shivered looking at it. It was a very strange thing to have painted inside a children's toy. It gave me the creeps. There was no way I was going to let my niece see such a disturbing symbol, so I decided I would just cover it up with a pretty design of a landscape or something. I studied each of the dolls more closely to decide which doll needed which repair and then gently placed each one in the part of the house that I felt that their station in life dictated. The house had everything a real house would. Countless appliances and pieces of furniture, toys and tools and even little pots and pans. I'd loved dolls as a child and I admit to feeling that same sense of childlike fascination as I moved them around their little house. After making a list of the supplies I would need to purchase for the project, I looked at the clock and realized that it was quite late and I was very hungry. I made myself a quick meal and with the smug anticipation of my cat's enthusiastic reaction, began pouring dry cat food into the bowl. The sound of the food pellets hitting the metal bowl never failed to send him stampeding into the kitchen to wolf it down. He didn't come, and instead he just remained hidden under the bed, still yowling furiously. Fine, you're lost, you big baby, I called to him and sat down to eat my own food. And after dinner, I showered, put on my pajamas, and after turning off all the lights, sat down and watched some television. Though it was hard to hear anything over the continuous howls of my cat. I had placed the dollhouse on the coffee table to work on it, and my gaze kept being drawn to it and that strange symbol above the fireplace. My eyes began to get very heavy, and I started to nod off. Once or twice, my head would jerk up from resting on my shoulder. And the third time this happened, I gave up, and I decided to call it a night. I went to stand up, and when I realized that something was very wrong with my living room, or more specifically, that I was no longer in my living room. Instead, I was sitting on an old sofa with a faded floral pattern that was heavily stained by some type of brownish goo. Next to me was a broken side table that had been turned on its side, and there was dust coating every inch of the floor. My television was nowhere to be seen except for an odd static light that resembled what you would see cast on the walls if it had been left on in a darkened room. There was a strange stillness in the air. It almost felt like I was underwater and hearing my own breath through a heavy, muted atmosphere. What the hell? I said aloud as I moved to explore the room. There was a large bookshelf to my right and as I approached it, I saw that it was filled with books all relating to alchemy, devil worship and witchcraft. 
I went to remove one of the books when my fingertips just hit flat wood, rather than leather or paper. The books weren't real. Their dimensions and titled spines had all just been painted on, but with such precision that it was nearly impossible to tell with the naked eye. Thoroughly confused at this point, I continued my exploration. I turned to see a fireplace. It was so large that it dominated nearly an entire wall. Embers glowed brightly inside it, but it emitted very little light. Then I saw the mural. The same one from the dollhouse, complete with a self-cannibalizing snake and the all-seeing eye. Around the design were small random smudges of black paint. Oh no, no, no! I thought to myself as a paralyzing dread filled my body. It's not possible. I'm not inside the dollhouse. I quickly ran from the room and found myself in a great hall, also identical to the dollhouse. Left was a huge grand staircase. To the right was a large wooden front door and straight ahead, a smaller sized door that I had a sinking feeling would lead to a dining room and a kitchen. I ran to the front doors and I grasped the handle, turning it as the heavy door creaked loudly. I ran through the doorway, needing to be free of the house when my body slammed hard into a solid wall of blackness. I felt blood pouring from my nose. As I fell backwards onto my butt and pain splintered through my entire body. On my hands and knees, I crawled back over to the open front door. I slowly stretched my fingers through the exit. There was indeed some invisible wall preventing me from leaving the house. And it was cold, so cold, that my fingertips started to ache and tingle, as though I were touching dry ice. I quickly snatched my hand back, and I struggled to come to terms to what was happening to me. Am I dreaming? I must be. The last thing I remembered was drifting off in front of the TV. My thoughts were interrupted by a steadily growing sound behind me. I could hear slow, heavy footsteps descending the staircase at my back. I felt the same creeping coldness that emanated from the void outside the front door as I turned to face the newcomer. Its body was solid wood, its limbs thick and brutish. A large white shirt and stained denim overalls hung off its hard frame. In one of its big bony hands, it held a pair of rusted antique gardening shears and in the other, a sharply pointed spade. On its head sat a black floppy hat and barely visible beneath the white brim, two small painted black eyes. The skin below them was molted, its features disfigured and its mouth consisted of a pale thin slash above its chin. One of its feet dragged behind it in an uneven gait as though the ankle joint had been broken and it slowly lumbered down the staircase. It was a horrific life-size depiction of the gardener doll and I screamed as it reached out towards me. In response to the sound, it quickened its pace down the stairs and moaned unintelligibly. In the gardener's hurry to reach me, it tripped over its broken ankle and proceeded to fall heavily down the remaining steps. Numb with terror, I ran towards the unopened door leading to the dining room. I threw it open, and it slammed shut behind me. The room was very dark. Though that strange artificial illumination from the living room seemed to follow me wherever I went. I tripped over a wooden chair and I landed hard on the floor, my own ankle throbbing. I took a few deep breaths to try to calm myself and think rationally about how to get out of this hellhouse. I suddenly became aware of the clanging sounds of pots and pans and a loud frantic humming emanating from a short distance away. Beyond a long, dusty dining table, I could barely make out the silhouette of a tall, swinging door with a circular glass panel cut into the top of it. As I gingerly got onto my feet, my ankle protesting the weight, I could barely make out a figure moving back and forth beyond the transparent circle. 
As quietly as possible, I made my way to it and gently pushed it open, just an inch or two to peek inside. A large woman was bustling around what was indeed a kitchen as she went through the motions of preparing a meal. Thick, dark liquid was boiling in a large pot on the old stove, and a putrid, rank smell permeated the air. The woman had her back turned to me as she used a huge, sharp knife to quickly chop through something on a large cutting board. She was humming loudly a random, disjointed tune as she worked. She had wild gray hair that stuck out indiscriminately from beneath a dingy gray bonnet, and her movements were jerky and wooden. I recognized her as the cook doll, and she was wearing the same brown dress and apron, and she was, well, cooking. I pushed my way a bit farther into the room, knowing that I couldn't go backwards and that the gardener could come crashing into the room at any moment. Maybe this woman could help me. When I stepped into the welcoming warmth of the kitchen, the floorboards creaked beneath me, and the woman froze. Her body became stiff as a board, literally, though she didn't turn around. And I noticed that her blocky hands gripped the knife much more forcefully. It's not quite ready yet, mistress, she said in a deep, sugary voice. I stayed silent for a moment before whispering, Please, I need your help. At the sound of my voice, she slowly began to turn her head, though her body remained still. As her head turned, her features were slowly revealed to me. Her eyes were two enormous green orbs, far too large and wide on her round face, and her painted eyelashes were black, angry strokes above them. Her mouth was drawn into an eternally wide smile, and her apple-shaped cheeks bore twin crimson circles. Her head kept turning, far beyond a natural angle, until it was centered firmly between her shoulder blades. She raised that knife she'd been using to chop with up to her lips, as if to shush me, and a dark syrupy substance dripped from it. You really shouldn't be here, miss. She said slowly in her low tones. Though it's been some time since we've had a new addition to our little family. Welcome home, dear. Her body snapped around to match her head, and she lunged at me. My gaze darted around the room frantically before landing on a large serrated knife, and I snatched it up just as the cook tackled me to the floor. The force of the landing caused me to drop my weapon. Her body was so heavy that I could barely breathe as she plunged her knife straight down towards my chest. I raised my arms and began swiping wildly at her. It took all of my strength to keep her at bay, though somehow I managed to dodge all of her vicious stabs. Everywhere her body came in contact with mine, it burned. An icy sting that was incredibly painful. She continued humming her mad melody as I concentrated my efforts on the arm holding her blade. I pulled as hard as I could on it, forcing it back and forth, in the hope I would dislodge the wooden joint. Finally, it gave with a tearing sound and a loud pop as her arm dropped to the floor. She continued to attack me with her remaining hand, however, showing not a hint of pain over her detached limb. Her smiling face leered down at me as she pummeled me about the head with her wooden fist. Each blow weakened me further and my struggles became less frantic until everything around me started to grow dim. Suddenly, Cook's large body was pulled off of me and I dragged down huge gulps of precious air as my consciousness slowly returned. Two tiny wooden figures were struggling with the Cook and I recognized them as the little girl doll and the young stable boy. The girl was pulling hard on the cook's remaining arm, throwing her off balance while the boy had jumped up on her back and was using my discarded knife to saw through her neck. The cook began screaming, Mistress! Mistress! Come quick! The children are misbehaving again! Suddenly her head dropped to the ground and rolled away, but her cries for help never ceased. Mistress! The two wooden Mistress. children chased after it, all the while making loud, 
shushing noises. The boy scooped up the head and threw it into an oven, finally muting the woman's shouts. Cook's body was still upright and stumbling around the kitchen, knocking over dishes and pans in a deafening cacophony of sound. The girl herded Cook's large body into a nearby pantry and quickly closed the door. Turning back to face me, she whispered, Shh, we don't want to wake up Mama. Before I could thank the children or ask any more questions, a tiny servant's bell on the adjacent wall began to ring, slowly at first, then it quickly morphed into a loud, constant jingle. The girl looked at me with her wide, painted eyes, and I swear, I could actually see the sheer terror overtake her expression. Too late! She's awake! The girl cried. Come with us! We have to hide! Now! I needed no further urging. I quickly jumped to my feet, my battered body protesting every movement as I followed the children out of the kitchen and back through the dining room. When they moved to open the door leading out to the grand staircase, I called out, Wait! The gardener! They ignored me and continued running as the little girl called back over her shoulder. He's not the one you need to worry about. Come on, follow me! Seeing no other option but to trust the girl, I obeyed and quickly followed after them. The freakish gardener was nowhere to be seen as we flew up the staircase and into the first door on the right. It was a bathroom complete with a large clawfoot copper tub. We all jumped inside it and pulled the curtain completely around it. We had just finished doing so when a beautiful feminine voice called out from somewhere outside the door. Amelia, my darling, where are you? The voice sounded so gentle and calm that I couldn't understand why the children were so afraid. My mind flashed back to the mother doll and I could recall nothing about her appearance that would warrant such terror. As we waited in the silence, I could hear the approach of soft, light footsteps down the hall. The little girl, whom I assumed was Amelia, began to tremble jerkily, and the stable boy reached out to place a comforting arm around her shoulders. The force of their wooden bodies connecting made a slight knocking sound, and they both froze. Amelia, stop playing games. Mama's looking for you, sweetheart. You and Wesley come out now, and bring your little friend. The sweet, soft voice of the mother slowly morphed into a low, demonic-sounding growl that instilled a terror in me so deep that I couldn't breathe. The footsteps stopped right outside the bathroom door, and I had to shove my whole fist inside my mouth. To stop myself from crying out, I watched in horror through a tiny gap in the curtain as the doorknob slowly turned and the door began to creak open. Suddenly, a loud crashing sound came from downstairs and an impossibly swift whooshing sound could be heard as the shadow of the mother abandoned the doorway. After a moment, Amelia and Wesley quietly stepped out of the tub and motioned me to do the same. My body was so sore and stiff from all of its abuse that I slipped trying to climb out. Wesley reached out to catch me and I cried out in pain when his wooden hand burned my skin. Ah. He quickly jerked it back and shook his head at me in what I assumed was an apology. Wesley doesn't speak, Amelia said. He, he didn't mean to hurt you. He just forgot that he's not supposed to touch. We need to get you out of here. The process has already started, and it won't be long now before you become like us. Every time you touch one of us, it will make it worse. I raised my hand up in front of my face to inspect it, and I was horrified to see that Amelia was right. The pain and the stiffness that I'd assume was due to injury was actually caused by my body slowly hardening. All of my fingers and the majority of my hand had become so wooden and hard, it had already spread down to my wrist. I was becoming a doll. How do I get out of here? I asked, struggling to remain calm. 
The little girl shook her head sadly and said, I'm not sure. We're not supposed to even be awake now. Something must have happened. When my mama died, Daddy made this house for us all to live in so that we wouldn't be lonely anymore. He came into my room one night and told me we were all going to live in the dollhouse. He said he fixed it so we could all be a family again and that Wes and all the other servants could come too. He brought me downstairs where everyone else was already sleeping on the floor. Then he did something to me. I don't remember what, it was a long time ago, but I woke up in the dollhouse and he was right. Everyone was here, but daddy never came. Our bodies all began changing and it hurt, but he never came. Mama must be so sad without him because she's changed too, but not like us. She's, I don't think she's really my mama anymore. She's mean. Then one day we all got really tired and mama started screaming. I tried to stay awake, but I was so tired. We all went to sleep and then you came. My mind raced as I tried to piece together everything she was telling me. It seemed Amelia's father had been into some pretty dark things, as I recalled seeing all the alchemy titles in the library. He must have lost his beloved wife and gone crazy, building this weird house. Then I remembered the strange symbol that had been painted above the fireplace. That's it, the symbol. Something had changed. I removed the paint that had been covering it up. Perhaps, as far-fetched as it seemed, all I needed to do was black out the symbol again. Could it really be that simple? I had to try it. I was running out of time and I could feel my body growing stiffer with every moment that passed. Amelia, listen. I think I know how to get us out of here. Do you know that strange drawing in the library? Well, I think I made a mistake. We need to destroy it. Will you and Wesley help me? When they both nodded their agreement, I asked, We need to cover it back up. Do you have any paint we could use? The two children looked at each other and then slowly shook their heads. Damn, I thought. Of course it wasn't going to be this easy. Okay, well, we just have to try to find something else that will work. Let's go back downstairs and... Just then, a clawed hand reached inside the door and grabbed Amelia. It all happened so fast that I barely got the impression of black skin and sharp red nails wrapping around her throat before she was just gone. That same whooshing sound accompanied her abrupt exit and Wesley stretched both hands out after her in a panicked and futile attempt to save her. I heard a cackling laugh fade down the hall and then the staircase. Wesley gave a strangled moan before turning to run out after her. Wait! I cried. We'll get her back. Wesley, I promise. First, we need a plan. And hopefully a weapon. Do you still have that knife? He shook his head sadly at me before perking up and motioning for me to follow him as he fled the room. I followed at a slower pace. My stiffening joints made it very hard to move, but I forced myself to keep up. Wesley passed by several doors before making his way up a set of steep stairs leading to what was, I assumed, the attic. He ran over to one of the old wooden chests located there and began removing bolts of cloth and various sewing implements before finally pulling out a wicked looking pair of sewing shears. After dropping the shears at my feet, he proceeded over to the small bed in the corner and dove underneath it. Reappearing moments later with a large pitchfork gripped tightly in his fist. My hands were now so stiff that it was incredibly difficult to even pick up the shears, and I marveled at how easy the doll's movement were compared to mine. Of course, they had much longer to adapt to their new bodies, and theirs were solid wood, not a confusing mesh of both. Just as I bent down to retrieve the shears, 
Movement out of the corner of my vision caused me to jump. I almost laughed when I realized that it was simply my reflection in the golden-edged floor-length mirror that I had noticed when first inspecting the dollhouse. Had that really only been hours ago? It felt like years had passed since I'd become trapped in this hellish place. Good job, Wesley. Now, we just need a plan. I assume the... the thing that grabbed Amelia was Mama? When he nodded, I continued. Okay, where would Mama have taken her? One of the bedrooms, or the kitchen? He shook his head no to both. Okay, the living room then. Do you think she knows what we're planning? Wesley nodded his head vigorously. Damn. Okay then. We just need to make some kind of distraction. To get Mama away from the living room and then we'll save Amelia and destroy the painting. Here's what we'll do. After Wesley and I agreed on a plan and went our separate ways, I crept back down the stairs and made my way through the door leading into the dining room. Then I froze. A young woman was kneeling on the ground and sobbing loudly as she furiously scrubbed the floors with a wet, dirty rag. She would pause every now and then to dip her rag into a bucket of equally filthy red liquid before sloshing it back down to continue her scrubbing. This must be the maid, I thought. I had no idea if she was going to be friend or foe, so I just slipped past her sobbing form unnoticed. She didn't even look up, just continued smearing the thick, dark liquid everywhere as she muttered to herself. I slipped through the kitchen door and I grabbed the thick dishcloth before opening the oven, wrapping the cook's still shrieking head up in the cloth. I then made my way over to the pantry. The moment I opened the door, cook's body came launching out at me, and I ran back through the swinging kitchen door before abruptly skidding to a halt. The maid was no longer on her knees. Instead, she was standing in the center of the dining room, smiling broadly at me through her strangely black-colored tears. Mistress will be so proud of me, Maid said as her body slowly lurched towards me. I'm not useless like she says. I'll make her see. The movements of her body were unlike any I'd seen from the other dolls. She'd moved as if all of her limbs had been pulled out of the socket and badly put back together. It created a shudder effect that was both eerie and highly efficient. I'll bring her what she wants and then she won't hurt me anymore. Maid fell on me then, pulling at my clothes and hair as she began pulling me towards the grand hall. Her strength was incredible and I dropped the cook's head in an effort to free myself from her relentless grasp. She pushed me through the door to the main foyer before I was finally able to get loose. And I turned to run before my legs gave out and I fell hard onto the ground. Looking down the length of my body, I was horrified to see that my legs were turning to solid wood. On one leg, the transformation had progressed all the way to mid-thigh. I began crawling towards the living room, dragging my mostly wooden leg behind me. The plan had gone all to hell, thanks to the maid's interference, but I was still determined to try. Behind me, chaos erupted as the cook's body slammed into the maids and they began fighting with each other. I shook my head to clear the stupor-inducing sight of two dolls viciously wrestling with each other and continued crawling towards the living room door. Reaching up, I used the door's handle to pull myself back up to my feet and I slowly turned around. The help, I was relieved to see, were so distracted by their efforts to maim and kill each other. They paid me no mind as I sneaked past them. I cautiously moved back the way I'd come, searching for the cook's head. After locating it in the far corner of the dining room, I made a return to the foyer when my gaze landed up on the maid's forgotten bucket of red liquid. It was thick and dark and seemed indistinguishable from human blood or paint. As quickly as I dared, I returned to the main foyer with a still humming head and my bucket of red goo. My heart was pounding as I raised the cook's head high into the air and called out. 
Hey, psychos! The crook and the maid froze and turned towards me as I threw the head as far as I possibly could up to the second floor. You want your head back so much? Then come and get it! I heard a loud crashing sound as it landed somewhere upstairs. It was immediately followed by more of the cook's shouts. Mistress, she's here! I've got her! Come quick! Hiding in the shadows of the grand staircase, I watched as the body of the cook stumbled towards the stairs, just as a blur of black and red skirts burst out of the living room door. Mama moved with such unnatural speed that I couldn't make out any of her features. In fact, I could barely track her movements as she flew up the stairs. I knew I had only one shot at this, and I had to move now. As fast as I could, I picked up the bucket and began hobbling towards the living room door. As I passed Maid, she drew in a deep breath, as though preparing to shout a warning. Before she could utter a sound, however, I swung the side of the bucket hard into her head, hearing a sharp cracking noise as the metal bucket connected. Maid fell to the floor, began twitching erratically as she struggled to get back up. I ran into the living room, softly closing the door behind me. Inside the room, Amelia was sat on the filthy sofa, sobbing with her hands covering her face. As I approached the young girl, I began hushing her softly, and she looked up, her little face brightening. It was then that I noticed that her tears were also black, just like the maid's. What did that mean? You're okay. She cried before I could ask her and ran over to hug me, then stopped herself and rested her wooden arms awkwardly back at her sides. Where's Wes? She asked quietly. If all is going according to plan, then he's upstairs leading Mama on a wild goose chase. I responded. She looked worried, and I knew she was concerned for the safety of her friend, but to be honest, I was too. Can dolls even die? I asked myself, before turning to the more immediate problem at hand. Quick, let's try to destroy the glyph, and then we'll all get out of here, I said, to which Amelia just gave a strange, sad smile before nodding. Finding the snake painting, I threw the bloody contents of the bucket over it, taking care to cover the entirety of it. Sparks began to shoot out of the wall, but beyond that, nothing happened. I could feel that my body was still hardening, and I was very much still inside the dollhouse. It hadn't worked. No! I cried internally, as hopelessness began to set in. Anger and despair welled within me as I pulled the sewing shears from the back waistband of my jeans and I proceeded to hack at the blood-soaked wall. With the very first stab of the scissors, a horrible demonic screeching reverberated from somewhere upstairs, and Amelia cried out, She's coming! Just then, Wesley burst into the living room and began wildly waving his arms in a follow-me gesture. In blind terror, I ran towards him, Amelia following close behind me. The terrifying screams and growls only grew louder as we followed Wesley upstairs to the second floor landing. Far down the hall, I could see billowing black skirts floating towards us at an extremely rapid pace. I could barely run anymore, and since I now had very little hope of ever leaving anyway, I grabbed Amelia and Wesley's shoulders in order to use their faster momentum to propel me forward. It caused me extreme pain, and I didn't even know where we were going, but all I could think of in that moment was to get away from Mama. The children all but pulled me up the stairs to the attic before they let me go, and I dropped hard onto the floor. I raised my head to see Wesley frantically pointing at something as Amelia cried out, Look at the mirror! It's glowing! Turning my attention to it, I could see what she meant. Not only was the mirror glowing, but instead of reflecting the attic scene around us, it was showing a different room. My living room. Was the mirror the way out? It must be a portal. I raised myself up and began crawling towards the glowing mirror. My movements were incredibly stiff and slow. My body now was almost completely solid. 
just as I was only a foot from the mirror with my arm outstretched towards it, Amelia screamed, <coughs> and a strong clawed hand gripped me by the throat and pulled me into the air. It was then I got my first real look at Mama. The beautiful doll of the mother bore little resemblance to the abomination standing before me. Her dark hair was wild, her skin an ashy black color, and her eyes were no longer a soft brown but rather a bright glowing red. She was impossibly tall and thin, wraith-like in her long black dress, and I noticed several gaping wounds across her torso. Unlike the rest of the dolls, she, it seemed, could bleed. She held me up with one hand around my neck as if I weighed nothing, and began to cackle at me as she spoke. <laughs> Finally, a new daughter to call my own. I felt the very last of my strength evaporating, just as the last few remaining bits of my flesh, bone, and muscle in my body gave way to cold, complete solidity. In that moment, I gave up, and I hung my head as Mama began to pull me closer to her freezing, demonic form. Out of nowhere came the squishy sound of metal slicing cleanly through skin. For a minute, I thought I'd been stabbed. My body again became reacquainted with the floor for what must have been the tenth time that night as I was dropped unceremoniously back to the ground. This time I felt no pain as I hit, and that should have terrified me, but it didn't. I barely reacted as my eyes took in the scene around me. The gardener is back, I thought numbly, and he's fighting with Mama now? I watched in a daze as the gardener repeatedly stabbed Mama with his rusty pruning shears, hatred burning in his dark eyes. Suddenly. Tiny hands, four of them to be precise, were lifting and pulling my body towards the mirror. I looked up to meet the determined little faces of Amelia and Wesley, and a single warm tear slid down my cheek. Thank you both, but I think it's too late. I, I can't feel anything anymore. I began sobbing harder as I spoke, and the reality of it fully settled in. Amelia just smiled softly and said, it's, it's not too late. Look, you can cry real tears. We can't. It's too late for us, but it's not too late for you. We'll get you back home. Taking care to touch me as little as possible, they held me up before the mirror. I realized then that the children had known all along that they couldn't be saved. That they had done all of this just to save me. Mama began to shriek harder from somewhere behind me, and I could hear the gardener give a low, gravelly laugh. Amelia whispered, Mac, our gardener never really liked Mama. She hurt him real bad, and now he protects us from her. You need to go through now, before it's too late. Wait, is there anything I can do for you? You've helped me so much. I trailed off as emotion once again choked my voice. Just keep us asleep. Once you go back through, we should all get sleepy again. I can already feel it happening. Don't let anyone wake us back up, okay? We're not meant to be awake. Amelia smiled sadly at me one last time before she and Wesley shoved my body through the portal. And I immediately lost consciousness. When I awoke some time later, I instantly became aware of two sensations. The first, and by far the strongest, was of intense pain coursing through every inch of my body. Second was the small, wet, sandpaper tongue of my cat Onyx, licking my cheek. I barely registered the ironic fact that I was once again face-planted on the floor before I jumped up to my feet and memories came flooding back. Ignoring the agony of each movement, I quickly surveyed my surroundings. Relief poured over me as I took in the familiar surroundings of my living room. And then, 
my gaze landed on the dollhouse. I knew it hadn't just been a dream. The injuries I had sustained in the dollhouse were still very much apparent, but if I had any doubts, one look at the dolls would have convinced me it had all been real. Maid and Cook lay frozen on top of each other and Maid's hands appeared to be clasped around the Cook's headless neck. The gardener's shears were still embedded inside Mama's torso, though she had returned to her pretty and motherly form. And he was standing over her body with what I would still swear was a triumphant look painted on his scarred face. Amelia and Wesley were curled up together on a small attic bed and appeared to be hugging each other tight. Despite the horror of everything I had endured the previous night, I smiled. It has been many years since all of this took place. And I have a little girl of my own now. I named her Amelia. Amelia is a typical girly child and she loves dolls. Immediately after waking up on my living room floor that morning, I burned the dollhouse and the entirety of its contents with three exceptions. Mac the gardener, Amelia, and Wesley have all been given pride of place situated on the mantle of my fireplace. My little girl loves to play with them on the few special occasions that she is given permission to do so. You see, I don't allow dollhouses into my home. The mere sight of one never fails to send me into near hysterics. But I owe everything to those three dolls. And my one regret in life has been that I haven't found a way to free them from their curse. So I am posting this here in the hopes that my crazy story might actually be taken seriously. And that someone out there might know how to help them. At the very least, this will hopefully serve to honor their memory and all they did to help me. Amelia and Wesley never even got the chance to reach adulthood, and all three of those lives were cut tragically short. If anyone has any suggestions, no matter how outlandish, I will listen. Thank you, Mac, Amelia, and Wesley. And for now, sleep tight. <laughs>